Hello, and welcome to A Million Other Choices. I am your host, Kim. Today's story was a listener suggestion by Melissa, who also brought to my attention the Katie Miller case. And as I was digging in, I realized that I have a lot of questions about the justice system here in Canada, particularly around life sentences and how the National Parole Board gives out day and full parole. In the reports, when they release someone out into the community, The reports themselves read very strangely. Like they'll say things like the crime was terrible and vicious, appellate has a problem with alcohol and anger management, but then the last sentence grants parole. It's like the keyboard they're using doesn't have the keys to type denied or something. They seriously look like typos after describing all of the issues the person continues to have and the list of all the reasons they are a danger to society and then stamped at the bottom, granted. And when the person goes out and does something else wrong, they give a statement saying that he was vetted based on information by experts and they don't have a crystal ball. In Canada, the focus of prison is rehabilitation. That's ridiculous in a system like a prison, which are basically like crime schools. We talk a really good game about educational and social programs for inmates to help them reintegrate safely into our communities, but we house prisoners in small spaces together. If you give a mother goose and her flock a baby duckling to raise, you can't expect the grown-up duck to act like a duck because he's now a goose. He is a product of the environment that he shares the majority of his time in. It is my personal opinion that if we took the money and resources and time that goes into these rehabilitation programs, which don't work, into social programs that took poverty, child abuse and neglect and sexual abuse off of the table, crime rates would go down, and then the prisons could be used for those that need to be housed for their full sentences. Anyways, on that rant, this is the murder of Amber Kerwin and Robert LeBlanc. Amber Dawn Kerwin was born on August 21st, 1992 to her dad Donald and mom Marjorie. Amber's family has been quite private since the events that surround her murder, so I hope that they are okay with me telling Amber's story, because it actually highlights some issues with our justice system. As I learned from Leah D. of The Least of These, when you write a script, imagine that you have to read it to the family of the victim and make sure that they would be okay with it. So if I don't know something, I'm just going to be honest, and I'm certainly not going to make it up to make the story flow better. So what I do know about Amber is that she attended Northumberland Regional High School and wanted more than anything to become a nurse. She had a wide and loyal group of friends. She was also very loyal and caring towards the people around her, and she had what her dad described as a timid nature. She had a brother named Liam and was dating a young man named Mason Campbell. In 2011, she was 19 years old and brimming with all of the hopes and dreams the world had to offer her. On her obituary is a picture of her smooshing her face into a kitten, giving it kisses. So that alone is enough to tell me she was a good soul. I'm an animal lover myself, and how you treat animals says a lot about your character. And she was one of the good ones. I also know that her favorite color was green. She was a pretty girl with hair that was sometimes dark brunette and other times blonde. She had an infectious smile. She was fairly quiet and shy around those that she didn't know, but opened up and friendly with her friends. She attended Girl Guides as a kid, just an all-around wholesome Canadian girl. Amber lived in an area of Pictou County in Nova Scotia called New Glasgow. Pictou County is along the banks of the eastern part of the river of Pictou, which flows into Pictou Harbour, which is part of the Northumberland Strait. It's a town with very Scottish roots, hence the naming of New Glasgow. And it is where the events of Amber's life and murder took place. New Glasgow is a town of about 10,000 people. Amber and Mason were in a long-term relationship, and Mason had built a very good relationship with Amber's family. By memorial videos on YouTube, it looks like Amber and Mason had been dating since their school days kind of growing up together. Amber was the type of young woman that didn't do risk. She was very smart. She did not like to walk alone at night. On the night of November 9th, 2011, which was the Canadian Thanksgiving Sunday, Amber and Mason hosted a Thanksgiving get-together with some friends, and it's not clear where they held this gathering. It sounds like Amber and Mason lived together in their own place. Afterwards, Amber went out with some friends to a place called Dooley's, which is a pub with a pool hall. 
and Mason stayed home. In Nova Scotia, the legal drinking age is 19, so she wasn't doing anything wrong. Uh, she did have a few drinks, and at 1.30 a.m., she called Mason to ask him to come and get her because it was late and she didn't want to be out by herself and her friends weren't ready to go yet. Mason had been drinking himself that night and maybe smoking a little weed. Um, he also didn't have insurance or his vehicle registered, so he knew that there was no way in hell that he should be out driving. But he figured, well, as long as he didn't pick her up right outside of Dooley's where there were probably cop cars parked. Um, in a lot of Canadian cities on the weekends, cops will basically sit outside of pubs where young or rough crowds converge just to keep an eye out for bar fights that spill outside or inebriated kids getting into parked cars to drive off. So he arranged for her to meet him outside of Big Al's convenience store, which was about a block or so away. I'm not going to go into any judgment about Mason's decision to drive that night. What's done is done. Um, but I also don't want to skip over it completely. Obviously, I'm against drinking and driving, but Mason has enough woulda, coulda, shouldas on his mind. And I have a big pet peeve about people reminding or coaching others about what they should or shouldn't have done after an event. Um, when you get heartburn from a donor and someone says you shouldn't have ate that. I mean, what does that really do? How does that help anything? Anyways, surveillance footage from outside the bar shows a kind of swaying but mostly coherent Amber exiting the pub and making her way through the crowd of people outside and down the street alone towards the convenience store which was on North Provo Street. Sure enough, a police car was parked directly across from the pub near the main entrance. Several minutes later when Mason arrived to get her, she wasn't there. Mason understandably freaked out a bit, but it's not like he could really drive all over the place looking for her. He did look around for her a bit. Um, I wasn't there, but I don't think he freaked out in an, oh my God, she's been kidnapped kind of way, but more in a, I was supposed to take care of her and I've lost her kind of way. It's the middle of the night now, so he's not really sure what to do. So he Facebook messaged Amber's aunt, but I don't think she answered a Again, it was the middle of the night. He called Amber's mom, Marjorie, in the morning after a night of no sleep to let her know that she hadn't come home and he couldn't find her. Now, Marjorie wasn't able to get a hold of Donald right away, um, her dad, because at that time he was working. But they're all just basically frantic. Amber was a very careful person. Um, that's the whole reason she called Mason to get her in the first place was because she knew that walking home or getting into a cab or just being by herself when she'd been drinking was kind of a dangerous thing for a young woman. As soon as Marjorie was able to contact Donald, they hightailed it to the police station and reported Amber missing. While the police and community searched, Marge and Donald did what I think any of us would do. Like numb zombies, they just drove around and walked the streets looking at faces for Amber. By October 16th, the community was distraught and terrified for Amber and held a candlelight walking vigil for her. And the Wall of Hope was born where hundreds of lit candles were arranged down a 65-foot block and an anonymous donor put up a $15,000 reward for a tip that led to finding her. The surveillance footage from Dooley shows that when she reached the corner of George Street and Archimedes, a vehicle was seen coming down George Street and then turning onto Archimedes. Uh, but she's just kind of a dot on the screen by that time. And the vehicle, which appears to be a sedan type, is too far away to really make out any kind of license plate or anything like that. The surveillance tape of Big Al's parking lot didn't show any sign of her. So she disappeared somewhere between where she can no longer be seen on Dooley's camera and the parking lot of Big Al's, literally like a city block of area. The morning Amber disappeared, which was the Thanksgiving Monday, um, before there was any news reports about the missing woman, a couple, Nathan Goodall and Lisa Williams, saw a car that they didn't recognize parked on Heath Bell Road, which was just at the end of their property line. It was parked near a wooded area leading to a logging road. The car was a newish model and clean. They noted it, thought it was out of place with that eerie instinct way that we have about noting details but not really noting them like subconsciously knowing that a clean car looked strange in that area where the road wasn't paved. Lisa thought about it, but she didn't really have any specific reason to feel uneasy about it until they heard that Amber was missing. So on a curious gut feeling, Lisa and Nathan took their dog for a walk and ventured into that area on Friday, October 14th, when they saw a pair of black leggings laying on the ground and some feather earrings hanging in a patch of bushes. Nathan said, like, Back away, let's call the cops. The leggings and earrings were later identified as belonging to Amber, 
um, by her two girlfriends, Christy and Morgan, who had been at Dooley's with her the night she disappeared. The earrings she had only recently bought for herself. Mason Campbell was by this time a mess. His Ford Focus had been seized by police in which they found duct tape and a shovel. He's running on no sleep and cigarettes for food. And he admitted to the police that he drove all night after drinking and smoking weed and didn't have insurance on his car. His girlfriend is missing and now he's been looked at by the cops. But rather than build a bunch of tension and suspense and make any inconsistencies, he told part of my storytelling by leading you in one direction just to have a twist ending. I'm just going to tell you that Mason had nothing to do with the disappearance of Amber. He was a good kid for the most part. Amber's family loved him enough that he's mentioned in her obituary as a loved one left behind to mourn and having a shovel in your car in October in Canada. It, that's just a smart move for a roadside kit. Isn't suspicious in itself. I'm only bringing it up because it kind of comes up later and I want you to be assured that as usual, the boyfriend was seriously looked into. Anyways, obviously after the discovery of the leggings and the earrings, the police focused their attention on the wooded area on Heathbell Road. It took a few days, but on November 5th, the police unfortunately found Amber. She was naked, face down, laying in a shallow grave alongside of the gravel logging road. Not far from where Amber's body was found was a camper trailer on the property of a woman named Alice Meyer. Just two days before Amber was found, her parents received a letter from Nova Scotia Community College letting them know that Amber had been accepted into the licensed practical nurse program. Amber had her wrists tied together with a rope that had been woven to be stronger by weaving in a sweater. She had defensive wounds like, wounds like cuts and bruises on her hands. The leggings and some other items of Amber's were torn in places and muddy. She had been stabbed multiple times. The exact number has not been released, but the medical examiner, Dr. Matthew Bowes, later testified that it was more than 10, and one of them was through her heart, and most of them were in the neck and upper body areas. It had been hard to count them because they were all so close together. Uh, she died from blood loss as a result of her wounds. By the time she was found, decomposition had started, so it was impossible to know when exactly she had died. A tox report showed that she had codeine, acetaminophen, and caffeine in her system, indicating that she might have been drugged. Uh, as I said earlier, Amber's family has remained very private, but released a statement saying, quote, it is with overwhelming sadness and grief that our worst fears were realized yesterday. Our beloved Amber will not be coming home to us. Words cannot express the sorrow and sense of loss we feel, end quote. So because Amber was found on Alice's property, she was, of course, questioned. She told police that she had been away at a rented cottage in Caribou over the Thanksgiving weekend, but at 9 a.m. in the morning, she had gotten a text from her stepbrother saying, Hey girl, I was at your place last night. I have some stuff in the trailer. I'll be back to get it. Just my pipe, laptop, and things in the trailer, not the mini home. Alice had asked if she should go and move them into the main house, but he had replied, no, he'll come and get them later. Now I have to take a big swing in the story here, which will initially confuse you, but just stay with me. We are now going to go back to January 2nd of 1998 to talk about a 53-year-old named Robert LeBlanc of Pictou, Nova Scotia, known to everyone as Bobby, married to Susan and father of three children. He had started his career as a foreman at a shipyard, but when the company he worked for shut down, him and Susan started a cab company, and, and soon things were really getting off the ground. At 5 p.m. that night, Bobby had got a call to pick up two teenagers in Heathbell, which is a small hamlet in Pictou County. Later that night, around 8.30, a concerned citizen put in a call to the cab company, which his wife heard as she often listened to the radio as a dispatcher. The caller said that he had come across one of their cabs, a black Pontiac Parisian, that appeared to be abandoned sitting in the middle of Pleasant Valley Road near Green Hill, which is about 20 kilometers southwest of Pictou. Susan was very concerned about this. There was no good reason that Bobby would have left his cab and definitely not in the middle of the road, nowhere near where he was dispatched to go. Uh, so she called the RCMP and they came out to check out the situation. RCMP walked around the vehicle, looked in the windows and then opened the trunk. And there was the body of Bobby LeBlanc. Now what was missing was $65 in cash and a pack of cigarettes didn't take long to track down the two teenage passengers, a 15-year-old and a 16-year-old that couldn't be named at the time because of the Youth Justice Act. 
They were later both charged as adults, but I couldn't find any record of the 16-year-old's name in any later documents. The 15-year-old was later identified as Christopher Falkner. Both were charged with first-degree murder. The autopsy revealed that Bobby had been strangled with a wire with such force that his larynx fractured and then bludgeoned with a hammer. In July 1999, the 16-year-old pled guilty to second-degree murder and was sentenced to life with no parole for seven years, um, but he didn't get to spend any of his sentence in a youth facility and was moved to the, from the very start to a max security penitentiary. The reason was because the judge felt that it was one of the worst crimes that he had ever dealt with. Um, but because I never found any record of his name, I have no idea about his current whereabouts. I do know that he was denied parole in 2004 and again in 2006 after he walked out on his own parole hearing. Um, there is a chance that he's still in prison based on the life sentence thing, but somehow I doubt it. Uh, you would think that a 16-year-old that could bludgeon someone with a hammer with no remorse for a pack of cigarettes wouldn't have a hope in hell of being rehabilitated in a facility where you can trag cigarettes for a toothbrush shaved into a shank, but he's likely been out and about for a good decade now. But we're going to focus our story on 15-year-old Christopher Falconer. Chris didn't have a criminal record before murdering Bobby, and he was described by a psychiatrist that examined him during his trial as... Quote, there was little evidence of distress with respects to the incident. I kind of hate it when they talk like that. The incident is Bobby's murder. Uh, more an impression of passive acceptance of both the incident and the consequences of it. However, he had an anger management issue and had started drinking heavily at the tender age of 12. Uh, he was given a life sentence as well, but started his term in a youth facility. But that didn't last for particularly long. In April 2000, he was transferred to Spring Hill Federal Prison after beating up another inmate. Then in 2009, when he was 26, Christopher was given a six-month term of day parole where he was to stay at a halfway house. And that lasted about two months before his day parole was suspended because he sat on a staff member at the halfway house. But for some crazy reason, the National Parole Board decided that parole would be good for him and he was perfectly safe to have out in our community and considered him a low risk to reoffend. The parole board found that for the most part he was compliant, but that he didn't have the life skills that a normal person outside of prison walls would have gotten, um, but didn't seem to want to do any of the things like learning a trade and maybe getting a job that would help him actually be reintegrated into society. But still, the National Parole Board thought that his day parole should be extended some more, although conceded that he hadn't made enough progress to get full parole. And that was in 2010. By May of 2011, I guess they figured he'd made such amazing progress in that time that he was granted full parole, where he went back to Heath Bell, staying at his parents' place, but sometimes would stay at his stepsister Alice's trailer. So now you can see why we took that big segue in the story. Coming back now to the events of Amber Kerwin's murder, Christopher Falconer had actually been arrested on November 9, 2011, just a few days after Amber's body had been found. He was walking along a street in New Glasgow carrying a switchblade, a couple of joints, and a magazine of bullets for a 22 caliber gun. Uh, these were, of course, violations of his parole. The fact that they discovered Amber's body was found on his stepsister's property they decide that a search warrant and recording his jailhouse phone calls was probably appropriate under the circumstances. And Chris had a couple of phone calls with his stepmom and dad and told him that based on rumors out there, he was probably going to be charged with murder. And quote, I was thinking I'm just going to end up pleading guilty on it anyways, if they do, just so it'll all save us a lot of stress. But his father assured them that they could handle the stress. On another call, he told his dad that he wasn't with anyone on the night Amber disappeared. His father repeatedly told him, do not plead guilty. But Chris wasn't sure of his own whereabouts that weekend, telling his dad that he woke up at a friend's place on October 9th, the morning after. But then when pushed a little bit by his dad, he actually wasn't sure where he woke up. A look at Chris, Chris's phone records showed that he had stopped using his phone for anything. He didn't send or answer any texts between 12.45 a.m. and 4.05 a.m. on October 9th. His cell phone did ping from downtown New Glasgow around 1.40, which was the same area of Dooley's Pub and ended up pinging in Heathbell as well. 
In his vehicle, a gray Chevy Impala, they found a black tank top, which had both Amber and Chris's DNA on it. They also found a bottle of Dasani water, which isn't that important other than it showed that it was his brand. Uh, they also found in his car latex gloves, a roll of duct tape, a plastic shopping bag, which had another roll of duct tape in it, and the black tank top. Uh, a second bottle of Dasani water was found in the camper trailer, and that one had trace amounts of codeine and acetaminophen in it. In the trailer, they also found duct tape. And what's interesting about this duct tape is that on it, there's a mirrored image of the Dooley's blue ink bar stamp. Uh, bits of Amber's blood and towels were found to be consistent with the type of fibers found in Amber's bindings. Um, which were first believed to be a sweater. Strands of her hair were found on the bed and bits of her sweater she had been wearing cut up on the floor. Um, now, they didn't find the knife that was used to kill Amber. Uh, they think that based on the amount of blood that she would have lost, that she was killed somewhere between the camper and where she was dumped and buried. Uh, staying true to his father's advice, he pled not guilty to first-degree murder. It didn't take a jury very long to convict him on January 28, 2014, after a three-week trial. Um, in fact, only seven and a half hours of deliberation were needed to review the evidence. And even without his prior criminal conviction for the mur murder of Bobby LeBlanc being admitted into that evidence, um, at the time, his defense lawyer, Mike Taylor, said, The decision they made can't come as a complete surprise to anybody. Obviously, I would have preferred for Mr. Falconer that it was different but the evidence was there and I can see them reaching the conclusion that they reached. Uh, he told reporters outside of the court that Chris was disappointed in the verdict because um, he had thought he had a decent chance of an acquittal. Uh, Taylor didn't think that they would be appealing, stating, we'll look at things in the days to come, but it's a little fresh right now to even consider an appeal. An appeal of a jury is extremely difficult. But appeal they did. In the appeal notice, the defense said that the case was circumstantial and there was no DNA found at the burial site that actually linked Chris to Amber and that anyone could have accessed the camper trailer. They also claimed that the police didn't put enough effort into looking at Mason Campbell, who they said was described as acting nervous. And of course, the duct tape and shovel were found in his vehicle. And the police didn't bother to compare his Ford Focus tires to impressions found in the ground near that burial site. In November 2015, his appeal was denied, uh, so he is currently back behind bars serving his second life sentence. His parole on his first conviction was obviously revoked. He was 31 when convicted of his second murder, putting him at 56 in 2036 when he's eligible for parole again. But I would sincerely hope that a second murder conviction only weeks after getting full parole for the first one would mean that he would not see parole again in his lifetime. But the justice system always seems to have surprises for us. Amber's family and friends have started a memorial fund through the Nova Scotia Community College, which you can call 1-866-745-7919 if you would like to donate to that. Um, there was a lovely mo monument to Amber erected in a park in New Glasgow, it is, there's a cemented pad with two wrought iron benches flanking a brick flower box. Beside that is this decorative wrought iron structure, kind of looks like a gate with a heart in the center in which sits a red candle in a glass box. Amber is buried at Our Lady of Lords Cemetery. And that was the murder of Amber Kerwin and Bobby LeBlanc. I wonder if the parole board had stamped Christopher's request in 2011 with the words denied if Amber would still be around today. And with that stupid question that pretty much answers itself, I'm going to be back again next week with another case. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs>